today we come to a theme that we've called Accelerate Transformation. Uh, here we talk about how do we grow when we connect. That's the question we want to answer. Main way we begin that commitment is in our life groups, our small groups. So let's just jump right in. Life groups have one simple purpose, to bring people together. It really is about connecting. We believe God created us to live in community with others. And only then, here I'll add the D, and only then can we experience the full life he intends for us. We believe life change happens in the context of relationships. Okay, I don't want to overstate this, but I think the idea is maybe we would say life change is accelerated. Maybe that's a better way to be careful not to overstate it. Um, and... <clears throat> It's, 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 it's often how we experience transformation and growth. When we're in community, we're helping one another, we're encouraging one another, we're strengthening one another, we're protecting one another, we're holding one another accountable. And this is really interesting to me in pastoral ministry because clearly, clearly there's a cultural shift away from community and away from, from some of what we want to see happen. People, well, I should be careful there. There's a, there is a desire and a value on community, and especially in some of the younger generations. But um, there was a day when I started out in ministry where, as a pastor, if someone visited Riverside and I wanted to visit in their home, that would frequently be welcomed even by some to be considered an honor. And um, I don't think I would even think of trying to initiate a home visit now. In fact, um, there came a time where frequently when we tried to, to do that, someone would say, oh, why don't we meet at a Starbucks or why don't we meet somewhere, uh, kind of a neutral site. Many people want to come and just not be seen. They want to just kind of check out things incognito and hidden. And yet there is a desire for people to, to know us and to connect in real community. So there's kind of a paradoxical situation here, but the reality is um, the reality is that we, we need one another. We, that we are to be a part of meaningful re relationships. So we say it here, this is not the only way transform transformation takes place, but the absence of open and growing relationships, community, the absence always hinders personal growth. I know that's a strong statement, but that's generally just an acknowledgement that isolation is not, is not healthy. Okay, a life group provides a place to connect. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, um, that as I have loved you, you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Uh, a life group provides a place to protect. Take care, brothers, lest there be any in any of you an unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So we looked at this actually um, in Sunday's message. We highlighted this under the first point and talked about how community is one of the ways that we experience God's protection. We were really, 
we were really unpacking this verse because we wanted to emphasize the deceitfulness of sin when we looked at deceitful eyes as a part of Sunday's message. And then Life Group provides a place to grow. This was the main idea, transformation. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Okay, so just some of the highlights. We're really wanting you to see, uh, like, so last week, gather. We give priority to singing. We give priority to preaching. And we also talked about prayer. And then connect our life groups, trying to help help you see that these are not just done because, well, it's Christian tradition or it's what evangelical churches do or it's what all churches do. There's a strong biblical basis for, um, for this practice, and this is what we believe is directing us. Okay, so when and where do groups meet? Groups meet throughout the year in six-week terms. So we do five to six terms. They're all six weeks. And so we're looking at 25 to 30 weeks a year. Um, we used to do um, 12 to 13 week terms. But we found that the six-week term, especially since COVID, has worked much better. That it gives more people opportunities to connect, more on-ramps. And during this six-week term, groups meet weekly. So six weeks terms, they, they meet weekly. And groups meet in a variety of places. Homes, parks, restaurants, coffee shops, office buildings. Uh, and virtually. So, um, obviously, we've met in less homes and less restaurants and less coffee shops in 2020, but we are starting to uh, connect again in some of these places, and that, that eventually will return, we hope. Uh, there are new groups every term, and it... it it makes it easy uh, for people to connect. We've got a uh, um, little testament. Yeah, jump in. Uh, Brian, so I, I just had a question on this group. So with, with there being new groups every five to six weeks or every six weeks or all the time, is the idea behind it to be in a different group each time or just kind of hop in a group, create a um, relationship and stay in there? So, when it switches, new people can hop in. Yeah, uh, excellent question. Uh, <clears throat> I think um, it's great if you get into a group and it's working and you're building meaningful relationships to, to stay and stay connected. So there's a real benefit to that and ongoing um, relationships that are growing deeper i think with that it's just important to be open to new people coming in and to be receiving them and okay. welcoming them and part of the concern is uh there were two there, there there was a day when we did small groups that would go for years and years and you know no terms at all no semesters no terms and we found that it was sometimes hard for new people to break into a group that had a long history and rich relationship. They, 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 people felt like it was a little challenging. And also, it's a lot to ask of a leader. We want you to make an indefinite forever kind of commitment to lead a small group. So for those reasons, uh, especially helping people um, – on-ramp and find points of connection that are not connected 
we're we're this is how we're doing it right now. Um, but having said all that, Ryan, if you're in need of a certain topic that gets added, you might take a break and go over to that group. Um, okay, and, thank you. You know, you know, there might be something that was. Um, you know, so we try to offer groups in Bible study, Bible application, life skills, and also uh, like-minded, uh, just affinity groups. So, you know, you might want to get with some other young adults or middle adults or, you know, young marrieds. And that's also part of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, this testimony by Kurt, this is Kurt right here playing basketball with one of our elders, uh, Tim Smith, and he just shares uh, groups have been an important part of my experience at Riverside. They've allowed me to connect with other members in a setting outside Sunday morning encouragement and exhortation to get through the week, all while discussing biblical truths. I have a deeper love for the family here at Riverside because of the time I spend opening up the word with and getting to know the people. Life groups go beyond casual interaction. They are deep, full, and refreshing. Okay. A question? So, yes. Mm, is What do you think of a member joining more than one? Like it's not on the same day, um, like the emphasis of the other one is more topical or Bible study or prayer. Is that okay? It is okay. And occasionally we have, we have someone do that. And um, so uh, particularly we'll have generally at least one dedicated prayer group. Okay. And that group, uh, depending on who's running it, sometimes they will they will gather either virtually or in person, and they, they will just pray start to finish. And they have certain things that they're praying about and goals. So there's not as much uh, care and relational connection and fellowship. But there is a spiritual fellowship, and it's beneficial, but it's also – an important value for us that we that we keep keep growing in prayer. Um, uh, also, yeah. I'm not interrupting. Last week, uh, did you mention baptism and the Lord's Supper? Is I know we don't do those regularly, but they uh, are part of worship, though. And I'm not sure what you did say about them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so. We do the Lord's Supper, we did once a month, and um, then we started doing some Zoom Lord's Suppers, and since we've gone back to meeting again, uh, we've got a challenge that we haven't quite solved with how we're going to do this. And uh, it's not actually the physical meeting because we can serve the elements in a pre-packaged little yeah. cup with grape juice and a wafer on top. And you peel back the top and the wafer's there. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a rather institutional feel, but it's actually a safe way in this COVID season for us to do it. The problem is really with those who are participating digitally. So based on mainly 1 Corinthians 11, the whole body uh, gathers and there's accountability and the Lord's Supper is to be taken by, by all who are present. And there is to be a, a, a preparation of the person and and of the body and we're celebrating that not just our own relationship with the lord and the intimacy there but that we are one one loaf one 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 body and we had a 
we had a comfort level with Zoom that people were actually participating and engaging. We could see them. We could talk to them. We could, we could, we could do that. Virtually is, uh, is a step away from that. So if we're just streaming the service and we say to people who are digitally watching, grab some wine or grape juice and bread, um, we don't see them. There's no accountability. There's no, there's no engagement. It's, it's in, in my mind, I'll speak for myself. It's kind of stretching the, the bounds of what um, it, 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 it moves us away from part of the actual intent of the Lord's supper, that it's about you individually and us as a body and so I'm not saying we won't do it. I'm saying we're taking our time to pray through it and think through it. So certain denominations, believe it or not, um, have won't have asked their their churches to not even do Zoom uh, Lord's Supper, and many churches are doing all virtual. So we're working through that, but we are definitely out of our rhythm of once a month right now. And um, you'll, we're, we're on it. You'll hear more. We do baptism as needed. And we're going to do baptism in various locations in this season and videotape it and then create video testimonies out of that. So an elder or pastor will, will go to the swimming pools or the ocean or, or even in our own baptistry at the church. And uh, you'll, you'll be hearing more about that as well. It's really kind of crazy, uh, Matt, but what's happened is the, uh, the COVID season kind of brought a lot of that to slow down or even a halt. And now we're, 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 we're thinking through how we'll do those. Okay. okay so, um, part of, uh, I mean, that, that's a basic overview of small groups. I think we have 14 life groups right now, and there's a directory of those. This is one of the life groups. There's a directory of those on the website, 954church.com. And I encourage you uh, we have two more weeks, uh, and then there'll be a couple of week break, and then we'll start again. We'll do one six week term that will end before Thanksgiving. Um, and then, oh, that can't be right, can it? Well, we have another, <laughs> we'll have another six week term, and whenever that starts, um, and then, um, I encourage you to jump into one of the groups at that time. If you're interested in leading a group, we have a training and you can, you can share that, sign up for that on the website as well. But before we exit out uh, totally from the topic, uh, I want to just talk for a minute about uh, how change happens. So we're talking about accelerating change and the benefit of community but I want to just unpack this a little bit more in terms of we started with this whole idea of, of being gospel centered. So the gospel is right at the center of everything we want to do. And we said the gospel is not just how we begin. It's how we grow. It's how we're empowered. And this little, this little diagram helps me. I got the idea from Paul David Tripp and Timothy Lane. And so Lane and, and Tripp wrote a book about change, and they used this diagram. Now, honestly, I've changed it quite a bit and adapted it and made it my own. So I'm sure if one of them looked at it, they would say, wow, you're, you're not doing that right at all. But <laughs> I like it. I like it better than theirs is quite complicated, and I've just simplified it. And 
Um, I, I, it's, it's basically the idea of three trees. And the first tree is the old man. It's the old me. The second tree is the cross. And the third tree is the new man. And, and what's particularly helpful about this, this analogy is th just what we know about trees and that there's a, there's a root system. And on the old tree, there's a certain fruit that's produced. Now, I've pictured a dead tree just to picture that our old man is dead. But there's, there's, there's a, a fruit. And many times we come along, sorry, and we, we look at the fruit of our lives. And it might be, you know, anger or gossip or... Uh, Worry. Bitterness, yeah, worry. Yeah. Or fear. Or lust. Right. And so we often um, will confess the fruit. We'll say, God, forgive me. I got angry and I spoke harshly or I use foul language, I lost self-control, I was mean to that person, um, and we'll confess these fruits. But we, all, we, all, we don't always go down here to look at the root system. And the cause of the fruit is what's being pushed out from, from the root system. Look at Matthew 7. Jesus said, Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So Jesus is saying the fruit here, it's coming from the heart. It's coming from the root system. So, you know, someone's going down the highway and they get cut off and maybe they get cut off again. Maybe they get cut off again, but then they get angry. And they get angry, and then they start shouting and honking the horn and maybe sending a little friendly hand signal and getting in an argument with the other driver. And, and so it's interesting. We deal with that in various ways. We say, well, I got angry, and I shouldn't have got angry, but the reason I got angry is they cut me off. No, that's actually just the occasion that brought it out. Jesus is saying that was actually in your heart. And when you dig into the roots, you could find that there are a lot of reasons you might get angry in your car. It might be because you're late or you're lost and or you got cut off. And whereas any of those things could frustrate you, the reason down here that you really get angry and lose self-control is important. Maybe it's because you are worried about your reputation and you're going to be late and the root is actually pride. Maybe it's because you felt disrespected. So again, but in a different way, the root is pride. Maybe it's because you're going to not make a sales appointment and it's a big deal and there's an idol in your heart of money and comfort and pleasure. Or maybe it's about uh, 
something completely different. There can be different reasons pushing out fruit up here. You could actually have a number of different roots that cause the same, the same activity. So when we come to the first tree, what we want to try to do is understand the fruit and the root. And we want to confess to God both. We want to start asking, uh, why? Why did I act that way? Why did I do that? What is it that I believe? is so important, um, right? So um, let's say if uh, any of you raise daughters and you have a daughter and you go to um, help her purchase some clothes and she wants to buy an outfit that you think uh, is not a Appropriate. It's too revealing. And there you are, you're in the store, in the changing room, and she throws an all outfit. She just goes on a rampage. This is a completely fictional story. Um, but let's just pretend for a minute, right? There could be a lot of reasons why, I mean, you think about, okay, that, that, those jeans don't come up high enough or the, the, the blouse doesn't come up high enough or it's too short or whatever it may be. Why would she throw just an all outfit over one or two inches of material? I mean, if you look at it logically, it's like, okay, this is just not logical, but what actually drives that is much deeper. It could be, a need for acceptance, a need for approval, a need for uh, uh, a preoccupation with attractiveness and wanting the, the wanting to build her life on those things. Now, it's interesting. I want to be careful here. They might not always in and of themselves be bad. They might be somewhat neutral might be even subjective. Maybe, maybe as a dad, uh, you might be too conservative, or as a mom, you might be overprotective. But the fit, the rage, the fruit up here is so inordinate, it's actually revealing something's off in the root structure. Now, as a parent, you can... You can try to remove these fruits and staple new ones on, but they won't. <laughs> they won't last. They won't live because they're not supported from the inside out. So it's very valuable. It's, it's, it's actually very transforming to practice 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that's first john 1 9 okay and to practice learning to confess at a deeper level we're, we're really here after the sin underneath the sin yeah. okay some more scriptural support Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Look at that. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We want to say, the circumstance made me do it. No, the circumstance just revealed what was in my heart, according to Jesus. The good person out of his good treasures brings forth good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, in the day of judgment, you'll give an account for every careless word they speak, for by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. That is very sobering, isn't it? 
Okay, so we want to deal with our hearts. Second tree is the cross. Let's look at the cross. The second tree. So the first tree, I'm confessing sin. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to search my heart and help me understand what's going on deeper down so I see the sin underneath the sin. The second tree is the cross. And here I bring my sin, I've confessed it, and I receive forgiveness. So I bring it here, I trust in Christ. My key activity here is to confess my sin, to trust in Christ, and to receive forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Um, along with that, we exercise our faith to put to death by the Spirit the fruit and works of our sinful nature. Romans 8, 13. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if you live by the Spirit, you'll put to death the deeds of the body you will live. So how does that work? Well, it works like this. I, I come to the cross. I receive forgiveness as I confess my sin. I trust in Christ. And then I'm asking the power of the gospel to be released in my life by the Spirit of God to help me walk in victory over these areas. Now, I'm purposing to obey, but I'm doing it by the power of the Spirit. And I'm relying on access to the Father strictly through Christ, not by my own human performance. But most important, it's just yeah, you have this first tree, okay? There's a root system. I'm confessing the roots and the fruit. I bring it all to the cross. I receive forgiveness. I receive uh, cleansing. A lot of us, we confess, but we really are not sure if we've been forgiven. Uh, I've been in, in pastoral counseling situations where someone confesses sin to me. It might not even be that serious, but they're weighed down by it. And I lead them through examining that and confessing it. We pray together. We don't rush through this process. I'm wanting to equip them in terms of, 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 of walking this out. And then when it's all over, I say, okay, uh, are, are, are you forgiven? And I get all kinds of answers at that time. I, a lot of times people will say, I don't know. I think I have to do better, and then I'll be forgiven. <laughs> no, 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 no. Christ paid for your sin. Receive forgiveness by faith in Christ. Sometimes I'll, I'll say, are you forgiven? Someone will say, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm forgiven. Why? Well, because God's kind. No, no. I mean, yes, God is kind, but that's not why you're for forgiven. You're forgiven because Jesus paid the price of your sin. Receive by faith in Jesus as your substitute what he's done. So we go to the second tree, we confess, we receive forgiveness. The third tree is the new me. This is who Jesus promises to make me, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Jesus has promised to mold me into the image of Jesus. And so now I come to this tree and I want to begin. Now to make, and I don't usually use this language, but I'm going to use it because I think it will help. I want to make a positive confession. So if, if the old tree here is, I've just got a real anger problem, real anger. And at the root of it is pride. I want to exalt myself. And when I don't get my way, I'm angry. And when someone disrespects me, I'm going to let them have it. I, I, I do the work. Of, of, of the Holy Spirit helping me to understand that. I, I bring it to the cross and confess the sin and receive forgiveness. Now, this next part is very helpful. Forgive my trees. I know they're ugly. They're not very good trees. But now I want to say, God, you're producing self-control. You're producing patience. You're producing forbearance. This is, who you, this is what you promised to do. This is who I am in Christ. And so I want to thank you for that. I want to say I believe by faith this is, this is the work of what you're doing. In marriage, there are times when one 
one member in the marriage will turn to the spouse and say, you know what? You've asked me to forgive you so many times for that. You're never going to change. And it's at that point where I want the offending spouse to say, you know what? I can see where you would believe that. I can see where that's how you would feel. And I truly am sorry. But I am changing, and I will change, because my hope is in Christ. It's not in my ability or my strength. So I'm not dismissing what you're saying, and, I, and I'm not going to pressure you to say that you forgive me. But I want to tell you there's hope in Jesus beyond what, you, what you've seen in me. It's a very important aspect for us. When we, friends, when we look at the Bible— the emphasis over and over again is to give thanks. Give thanks. It's to encourage. It's to edify. It's to build up, which is what edify means. Right? When we have loved ones that are struggling and they, they start to do a little bit better, they start to improve, Many, many times, we don't give thanks, we don't encourage, we don't edify, we don't say, man, this is great, way to go. We say, we're afraid that if we, if we start commending, they'll quit trying. Isn't that true? Many times we're afraid if we say, hey, you're doing great. I'm grateful to God for what you're doing. Well, it's because <laughs> we're trying to base it all on our strength all on our performance. And um, we need to learn to follow a gospel model. You cannot find, uh, maybe love is the only thing that's emphasized to the same degree as giving thanks is to, to characterize the life of the Christian and their spiritual reality. Okay, so we got a couple of scriptures here just to, to talk about this. It says, do not lie to one another. We're in Colossians. Seeing that you've put on the, off the old self with its practices, you've put on the new self. And see, that's what we're trying to do with these three trees. We come to try Christ. We're putting off the old. We're putting on the new. Just a little exercise to help you do that. Confess your sin from the roots, the old self. Receive forgiveness at the cross. And then... Put on the new self. Um, there's, there's like a, a deliberate conscious action. I am a new man in Christ. I'm a new woman in Christ, which is being renewed by the knowledge after the creator, after the image of his creator. Here there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. So look. He, he's going to tell you what to put on, but before he tells you what to put on, he tells you who you are. You are God's chosen ones. You're holy. You're loved. This is who you are. This is your identity. And, and um, that's, that's just massive. And... The ability then to move past that, to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, that flows from this identity of knowing I've been chosen by God. I'm holy. I've been set apart for a special purpose under the Lord. I'm loved by God. You see how the doing flows out of the identity of who we've been made in Christ. Um, so, you know, it just goes on above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect har harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. He's really calling on us to consciously live out who we are in our identity in Christ. Romans 12, one and two. It's fascinating to see here how this how this plays out. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. All right, that statement, that sentence, is Paul's summary of how to live the Christian life. Climb up on the altar, 
and you're alive, but you are dead. You, you're, you're a living sacrifice. Now, he only does that after 11, count them, 11 chapters of talking about the gospel, of talking about your identity, how the old man and the new man all flows from, we, we move away from the old man to the new man because of the power of the gospel, Romans 1, 16 and 17. We experience it by faith. Okay, now out of that identity, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, it's the gospel, it's God's kindness to you, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay, he says, this is the way we worship. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So there's this whole process of, of not being conformed to the world, but experiencing transformation as my mind is renewed according to the gospel, according to my new identity, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. So now, as I go to do, as I, as I do, I'm actually learning by doing, I'm testing. And I'm learning to discern. I'm learning the will of God by walking it out. And I experience what's good and acceptable and perfect by doing and discerning. And then conviction takes over my heart because my experience is beginning now, though imperfectly, to mirror the identity that Christ has given to me. All right, I'm dumping a lot of practical theology on you are you are you with me yes any questions any questions is this helpful helpful very helpful thank you for simplifying the three threes i've seen that before but for some reason it's probably it's just me not anyone here like it didn't click or I guess also the analogy that this is not just a one-time event that until the day I see my Savior, I will have, well, not on my own strength, but I, I'm just thinking like uh, the analogy of weeding, like removing the fruits, but I cannot do that on my own. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good, Resi. We give ourselves to it, but we can only do it by the grace of God as, as God is at work in our lives. Excellent. Well, yeah, Matt, so, yeah, go ahead, Matt. I was just going to say, for the other piece is holding on to that true identity is, I think, so critical because as one who has um, regularly beat himself up for his inability to live a holy life, over the course of several decades, um, I, I finally has started to click in the last few years that that identity of who I am in Christ is settled. Like that's not a question. Once I cross that, you know, that's that's not a question. The question is how do I how do I, in, I guess, walk in the truth of that identity and yeah. um, align my life without derailing. So I'm still here. I'm still in this body of flesh. I still am going to make mistakes. But those mistakes don't define my identity. That's and, right. You know, that disconnect, that disconnect for me was really, really hard to overcome. Yeah, that's part of the renewal of our minds that God wants to bring, uh, Matt. You're not alone. And I think that, that this is just one model to help you do that. When you when you come back and you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing this so imperfectly. We come to the first tree. We confess the sin. We look at the roots. We confess it. We receive forgiveness. And then begin to confess, yes, Lord, you're bringing change. And even the delay was purposeful. You're using right. that. You're using that for good. You're, 
you're I, I'm I'm now more conscious that it's you doing it and my dependence on you has increased because of the nature of the struggle that I've been involved in. Yep. Okay, Ephesians four. Let's just look at this and then we'll be done for the night. Uh, we looked at this first paragraph Sunday. Now I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the nations, as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of heart. So notice head and heart. This is the transformation that God brings, head and heart. In our lost state, there's an ignorance, there's a hardness. They've become callous, given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But this is not true. The way you've learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So again, you see very similar language, putting off, putting on. We're learning now to walk out our identity in Christ. And uh, the spirit of our minds, the very way we, th we think, the, the atmosphere of our minds, the tone of our minds, the, the climate of our thinking, is changing. Um, there's a there's a, a reversal. Uh, instead of I'm I'm unloved, unwanted, rejected, whatever the old the old perspective was. Even though now you stumble and fall, there's an identity of I'm loved in the Father. I'm accepted. I've been chosen. I'm holy. I'm I'm loved, and. It's this is important because what's happened is this is Genesis 2, Genesis 3, uh, Genesis 1 and 2 language. I was created in the image of God. I was created in the likeness of God. And now Jesus is, sh I'm being shaped into that which I lost through sin. Now, this is very interesting. It says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his le with his neighbor for we are members of one another okay you know what that is so that's the old and the new and in between is christ so there's the there's the old tree and the, i know it looks like a person i'm sorry so sorry for my drawing and then there's the new tree okay so look over here there's a fruit of falsehood. But what's a, he gives this, this example. It's not meant to be exhaustive. He gives this example of what is in the root structure. We are members of one another. When I lie to you, I'm being selfish. I'm, being, I'm rejecting you. I'm being hateful. I'm. Th this is the same continuum here as murder. Now, I, I may not be killing you, but I'm. I'm. I'm killing your personhood. I'm saying you don't matter. You're not worthy of the truth. I'm more important. I'm not going to love you. I'm going to use you to get what I want. Over here in the new man, there's. There's a. There's. There's a a love structure where I'm being transformed. And now I tell you the truth in love because we're members of one another. This is over here. It's complete independence, but over here I'm, I'm owning you and you're, you're good and bad and everything in between. I'm saying, I am my brother's keeper. It's a reversal of Genesis chapter 3. So he just goes on. 
right? Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Okay, so there's a, a put off, a put on, and a key thought. Let the thief steal no longer, but will rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with everyone in need. He's giving you an example of either what not to think or either what to embrace. Okay, I don't want to steal. Stealing, I'm taking from someone else. I want to give. I want to work so that I have something to give to bless one and uh, someone else. Just it's just uh, this whole Ephesians four passage kind of walks you through just this. Really, it's surface. It's a casual. It's meant to be, I think, illustrative. It's illustrating how a renewed mind begins to think. Uh, the old mind would be legalistic. We don't want to get the truth. Right? Would say, it might try to say, I can't tell the truth because that's wrong and I would be condemned. Okay, yeah, that's true, but it's still got me at the center. I'm trying to justify me. It's 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 doing away with this inner tree and saying, I've got to justify myself by keeping the rules. And in the end, it leads to condemnation, and I'll find ways around it to still lie to you. I noticed this in my, in my carnality. I could find ways to technically tell the truth and still deceive you. Right? Um, and um, we find ways to, to legally get around the real spirit of the law, which Jesus dealt with in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Okay, now, why do we do the three trees right here in this chapter? Because we're saying transformations accelerated in community. What a wonderful opportunity when you sit down starting with your spouse, starting with your, those closest to you, but building relationships in the body of Christ where you begin to process some of these things. I have quite a number of, of individuals in my life, my wife and my brother and others, but I have really key relationships here in South Florida and in the local church where I can confess my sin they know me. They know which sins I'm more likely to go to and which roots are the ones pushing them out. And it's helpful. It's, it's, it's a place where it's not appropriate for me to like uh, uh, come to you, Matt Pittman, and say, hey, I'm going to just – I'm going to start pointing out the bad fruit in your life and the roots, right? I got to – it comes by invitation. It comes out of love. It comes as we build the bridge. But I think um, it starts with, you know, me saying to you, hey, uh, I've been really irritable lately, um, you know, and I, I, I just, I, I think I'm not in a good place. And I think, uh, I think it's because I'm burned out and I'm fried and I'm trying to do too much. And then there's an opportunity for you as a friend, Matt, to say, well, Brian, why do you think you're doing too much? Okay, that's a why question. It's you're trying to get at the root of what's pushing that out. Well, yeah, because, and then there could be a lot of things that follow. And depending on the relationship and how far the Spirit of God lets, uh, go, lets us go, you can really gain value i i had a friend i'm a, 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 a oh, sorry that's my dog i'm afraid to tell you this who came to me and said hey you know money is really a stronghold in my life i and i don't want to give i don't want to tithe and i need help in this area i said okay do you really want me to help you yeah i really want you to help me um um and I said, okay, do you want me to hold you accountable? And he says, yeah. So well, I said, what's the standard you want me to hold you accountable? Well, I want a tithe. Okay. I said, all right, what's a tithe to you? Well, it's a tenth. I said, okay, it's a tenth of what? And we talked about, you know, what, what 
what that was and what he believed it was. And I didn't try to enforce anything on him, you know, and I, 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 this was not, listen, this was not, this, this was not some high roller. This was not a fundraising event. This was a brother helping a brother, right? No, you know, a little time goes by and, you know, I said, Hey man, how are you doing with the tithing? He goes, uh, yeah, I'm giving. And I said, okay, well you're giving, but you committed to tithe. Have you tithed 10% each week? since the conversation well at first he got angry at me right it was just such a direct question i mean not like really angry but like you know dude don't get legalistic with me that's not cool and then you know what in a moment he goes man this is just hard for me i love money i said okay well just confess that to the lord tell the lord that and ask him to forgive you take it to the cross it's a powerful self-awareness. Don't live in that. Move to take it to the cross. And he, so he said, yeah. And he immediately set up auto pay uh, where his, his tithe was taken out every week. So like I would ask him a few weeks later, he goes, yeah, I'm on auto pay. <laughs> he was so grumpy about it. Uh, but now years later, this is uh this is he's experiencing the fruit of the spirit so there's a benefit that we can play in one another's lives i'm just it's just a silly story to illustrate that okay friends we want you to connect in small group gather connect serve grow and uh we've got two more weeks and we'll be unpacking those last two i trust and hope that this is this is beneficial for you guys mm-hmm.